I am ready. Okay. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, colleagues from around the world. Thank you for joining us for uh, what we think will be uh, an exciting and dynamic conversation from a group of uh, youth leaders who bring different experiences and perspectives to a conversation on uh, COVID-19, the impacts, the consequences uh, for young people in their communities around the world. Let me just uh, tell you briefly about uh, those who will be uh, speaking. We're very excited uh, to have such a terrific uh, group of uh, wonderful youth leaders. Uh, so the uh, first is Yidnekachu Mogasi, and uh, Yidnek is an intern medical doctor uh, in Addis Ababa. He serves in multiple youth leadership uh, uh, roles. It's the FP 2020 Youth Focal Point for Ethiopia and the UN Foundation. Uh, the International Youth Alliance for Family Planning, country coordinator, is a youth advisory panelist uh, for AMREF uh, Health Africa, and uh, so much more. He is a champion of youth engagement uh, and uh, for uh, youth sexual and reproductive health. He was one of 12 global recipients in 2019. Uh, for the ECFMG FAMER, F-A-I-M-E-R FAMER Award uh, in uh, sexual health education. Uh, and he also serves as an advisor to the Ministry of Health in Ethiopia. Uh, the next uh, speaker is Eka Perni. Eka is uh, the Youth Country Coordinator of GUSO, Get Up and Speak Out in Indonesia, and is the Program manage, Manager of GUSO in IPPA, the Indonesian Planned Parenthood Association in Bali. GUSO is an empowerment program for young people to enjoy sexual and reproductive health and rights, comprehensive sex education, youth empowerment, gender equality, and uh, enhance youth-friendly uh, services for young people throughout uh, Indonesia. She has a background in public health from uh, uh, the university, Udaipur University in Bali. The uh, next speaker, is Andrea uh, Gomez Barbosa, Adriana. I should mention it is five o'clock in the morning for Adriana who uh, uh, has joined us from Costa Rica. Uh, she is a, a consultant entrepreneur. She's a founding partner and CEO of uh, Goom Transformando, a small enterprise working toward co-transforming the way we do business focused on entrepreneurship and women's empowerment. She's also co-founder of Soy Nina, uh, an NGO that promotes girl empowerment and a selected uh, youth delegate and keynote speaker at the International Conference of Family Planning in Kigali, Rwanda in 2018, where I had the opportunity to uh, meet her. She has 10 years of experience in leadership and advocacy uh, roles. And uh, finally, but not least, is Joshua Dilwar. 
Uh, Joshua is a recipient of uh, the Gates Institute 120 Under 40 Youth Leader Program and also Women Deliver Sexual and Reproductive Health Advocate. He is the founder of the Institute for Social and Youth Development. Uh, one of the many things that Joshua does is a performer, an actor, and he uses the arts as tools uh, for uh, advocacy and promoting uh, human rights. He uh, currently uh, leads Live Now campaign in Pakistan, which is a platform uh, to create opportunity to engage young people in productive activities during the pandemic, to ensure the well being of adolescents and young people. And he is also an active member of the International Youth Alliance for Family Planning. So, uh, as you can hear, these are uh, highly engaged uh, young people who provide great leadership within their countries. Let me uh, turn it to uh, you, uh, Yannick, uh, to lead us off. Yannick, I'm not sure if it is at my end that there's an audio problem. We were able to hear you clearly at the test run. It does not look like your microphone is on. Hello, can you hear me now? Yes. Great. Okay, thank you, Bob, and thank you, Global Early Adults and Studies. And I'm super excited to virtually meeting you all today. And it's my pleasure on the behalf of the International Youth Alliance on Family Planning, um, Ethiopia to speak in this webinar on COVID-19 as a perspective from youth leaders around the world. First, I would like to thank the Global Early Adults and Studies for taking this initiative and bringing so many great voices together and working so diligently prioritizing adolescents and young people across the world. And um, yeah, Nick, super... Let me interrupt long enough. Can you click on your uh, video? Yeah, sure. Uh, maybe the host might allow me. Queen, would Queen, you could, mind? Could you facilitate that? Yes, I'm gonna try and fix that for you. While Quinn is working on it, let me just ask that if you have questions, and I see there's already one uh, posted, as we go on, please post them in the Q&A uh, box. Okay, Yednek, you should be able to turn it on. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Um, as I was saying, I would like to thank the Global Early Adults and Studies for taking this initiative and bringing so many great voices together and working so diligently prioritizing adolescents and young people across the world. And I'm super excited to be one of the panelists along with different vibrant youth leaders across the world. And now let me show you some uh, facts about my country, Ethiopia. And it's a, a country which is found in African continent and it's located at the eastern parts of Africa, having a population of nearly 115 million in which 70% of this population is under the age of 30, which is about 80 million of the population. And uh, I would like to, regarding the COVID-19 and a perspective from, uh, as a young leader, I would like to discuss some points on education and the consequences of school being closed, as well as later on, on the access of healthcare services. From previous experience during these pandemics, adolescents and young people, especially women, are more vulnerable. And it's clear that 
COVID-19 has brought up unprecedented challenges in sexual reproductive health and rights and other health matters. And it's been more than three months since COVID-19 pandemic started hitting Ethiopia. And most importantly, this pandemic has been putting a negative impact on Ethiopian uh, children, adolescents, and youth women. And for instance, gender-based violence, including or ranging from physical, psychological, economic, including sexual violence and early marriage and other domestic violence has been increasing. And I want to share some staggering statistics regarding the gender-based violence and underage marriage. And that for the past two months, uh, the schools have been closed and within one region, and Ethiopia have at least nine regions, and within one region, there have been 585 underage marriages and 1,070 were averted. And furthermore, within the past 80 days, about 280 women and adolescents has been raped and sexually molested. Why? So the main thing regarding this is that of due to um, schools used to be as, as a protective site for those students and children. And it's mainly due to increased spending time with the per perpetrator within their home. And due to the disruption of social networks, it can be with school friends, teachers, and other social services those uh, students or those people or women who have been uh, facing this gender-based violence cannot report these uh, things. And it's been only like 5% of these cases have been reported so far. And the disruption of legal services like workers make it like more complicated for this matter. And lack of innovative reporting mechanism, for, for instance, hotlines at the beginning of these pandemics like it's, it does, um, like no one have given that much of emphasis, but nowadays that are improving and I'll come to the social later on. And regarding the health care access services, the World Health Organization has identified services related to maternal and child health, reproductive health, including care during pregnancy and childbirth as one of the seven essential health services during the COVID-19 pandemic. And despite this operational guidance, many young mothers and other adolescents tend to uh, give home births due to fear of contracting COVID-19 in health institutions and due to different factors, and which results in different maternal and neonatal complications, including adult symptoms. Um, and when it comes to the healthcare, due to the lack of the personal protective equipment for service providers, for health extension workers and others, and the other one is also that there's a huge demand of workforce that some of the people have been shifted from this one place of work to the other due to this COVID pandemics, which we are seeing in all over the world. And relatively due to the initiative of the RMNTH, the Reproductive Maternal Newborn and Child Health, uh, strong dedication for this one, at least the services has been continued so far. But in the future, they are, they are not guaranteed to continue. And so some of the healthcare providers are either in quarantine or, um, or like have been contracting COVID and this has been creating some difficulties in delivering these essential healthcare services. And maybe in the future, this supply chain might break regarding family planning services and others. And as a solution, as a young leader, it's our responsibility to make sure that young people do not get disfranchised by these pandemics. And since the, since the pandemics, as a medical doctor and adult and news health advocate, I've been serving as a physician, giving necessary and appropriate care for neonates, for uh, young people, as well as for young mothers. And in addition to this, I've been volunteering as an advisor in the Minister of Health, Adult and News Health Technical Working Group, develop my, developing a, program, a programmatic guidance and mitigation plan for adults and news health in the context of COVID-19 pandemics. And regarding family planning services, initiation and continuation of contraception is an essential for service in all phases of the pandemic, whether you can see it before the pandemic, during the pandemic, or after the pandemic. And it's also important to inform these young people on how to access this contraception um, services. So this is more or less what I've been doing so far and the challenges that we are facing as a country. Thank you.
Thank you very much. Uh, very appreciated. And uh, let's uh, move to Eka. Yeah, so um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening for everyone around the world. So uh, I'm talking from Bali, Indonesia. So Indonesia is a Southeast Asian country and then uh, consists of more than 200 million people. So a lot of people here. So in terms of COVID-19 statistics right here uh, in Indonesia today, the total number of infections uh, nationwide already reach up to 38,000 people and uh, 14,000 among of them are recovered. But still the death is increasing every day and then the death is uh, 2,134. Well, actually uh, this kind of platform, uh, I will not really uh, share about the, the, the negative information only, but also what we as a young people already did as uh as a solutions to uh yeah to uh to really address the challenges that we have faced in the in this kind of crisis conditions yeah uh so in indonesia itself the government declares covid 19 as national disaster in indonesia on march and its implications was the social restrictions so i think it also the same uh, conditions that happens in around the world and in every country but nowadays, we face the significantly different a policy that we uh, that we or the government are ready to implement a new normal life, which uh, several business uh, will be open up. The government officials will be open up, and then the school planning to open up uh, later, but still consider it to not open still when when the case is still increasing every day. So uh, in this kind of platform, I would like to share about the educational aspects and also the sexual and reproductive health uh, issues on young people. And uh, so the impact of COVID-19, and I believe that it also happens to every country around this world, that education, almost all of the schools are closed and students have to study from home. Means they have to enough, um, internet access have to enough uh, mobile phone to facilitate the online learning and however this kind of conditions widen the gap of uh, the peoples that have um, a mobile phone or not and i believe that uh, the peoples in the remote area didn't have the internet access good enough like uh, peoples in the urban area so the inclusive online learning is not really um, happened when uh, it comes to the online learning system. So uh, for the sexual and reproductive health services in Indonesia, basically uh, we have the policy where uh, adolescents' reproductive health become one of the essential uh, reproductive health services that have to be provided by the government. The terms of essential means uh, this, are, this kind of services have to be provided in every kind of situations, including the, the crisis situations, uh, uh, including the natural disasters uh, situations. But, but actually, unfortunately, in this kind of uh, crisis in COVID-19, reproductive health is not become the priority of uh, the health services that provided by the government that implicate uh, several public health services not really provide uh, reproductive health or maternal services to, to the people, uh, especially for the young people. And then, uh, and then the conditions at the beginning also seem like what happened in Ethiopia where the health worker uh, is really lack of PPA or personal protective equipments that, that also implicate the reducing the operational hours of the public health services and the methods of services. And uh, to encounter that kind of challenges, the government allow uh, the public health services and also the other clinics to provide the telemedicines or online health services where the people uh, can access the health services through online, through applications, through um, WhatsApp, for example, and then the other certain health uh, applications that were provided uh, in the private sector as well. And then, 
Yeah, based on the One Vision Alliance in Indonesia data, where uh, I work with uh, this alliance uh, as well. So uh, based on this survey, uh, there are some changes of the health services in Indonesia, including method of service that have been uh, mentioned previously, uh, operational hours, and also health service closure for temporary. It means that uh, implicate uh, the peoples that access the contraceptions itself. We, we also face the crisis of uh, IUD, uh, IUD stock that is reduced 30% 30, uh, 30 for four months uh, ahead. But, but now the government still uh, restocked the, uh, the stock of the contraception. So uh, the unmet need still, uh, still not really high. And yeah, because of this kind of crisis, we have to uh, stay at home and then it's not really uh, doing the physical uh, interaction. So uh, the online things is really uh, increasing. Digital platforms is really, increasing to utilize for a uh, providing education provide uh, health services as well and then um, one of our initiative as a young people in indonesia uh, that work in the sexual and reproductive health that is provided the sexual uh, health information and educations through online learning that's not really uh that's not only uh the interactive sessions but also more uh, interesting methods that is games online as well through video as well and then a series of class for the young people who uh, who want to know about the sexual and reproductive health information and educations where well actually uh, as a young people it's not only uh, uh, not only provide information uh, of sexual health to the young, to the other young people but also from teachers in school where we, we also uh, provide some sexual health information and education for teachers to uh, yeah to have to receive the information about it and then can share the information to, to the students as well. So that's kind of uh, innovations that uh, aim to ensure the sexual and health reproductive uh, information and education still still there and still provided to prevent uh, the unwanted pregnancy among the um, adolescents or among the young people uh, yeah and also yeah and also uh, contribute to contribute meaningfully uh, as a young people to uh, yeah to really uh, uh, tackle the challenges in these crisis uh, situations as well and yeah and actually we st uh, right now because of the new normal situations that the government uh, got ready to implement it uh starting uh starting today actually so we have to be ready for uh for really increasing the awareness of our personal hygiene because uh maybe i can say that the positive impact of this kind of COVID situation is uh, all of the people especially also young people really aware of the personal hygiene like uh, wearing a mask and then doing some uh yeah personal hygiene uh wash wash uh, washing hand properly and then uh, how to not really uh, have a close contact to the others and then aware of their kind of health condition and then to do sports uh, to have enough rest and then to do some kind of positive activities so i think yeah it's not only about the negative impact but we also can uh, uh, learn something about uh, about a positive things or positive personal development in this kind of crisis uh, situations yeah so yeah so i hope that you all also have kind of a positive uh, development in this kind of crisis situations as well yeah i think that's uh, enough information i can share uh, right now maybe if you have further uh, questions you can uh, ask me through the questions and answer session thank you Thank you very much, Eka. And uh, we'll turn it now to Adriana. Well, thank you. Thank you very much, everyone, for being here. And thank you for having me. Um, there are a lot of topics uh, I would like to address. But since the time is limited, um, I will just discuss a few. Um, first, I would like to refer to the Costa Rican scenario. Costa Rica is a small country located in the middle of America. We're just in Central America. 
and we report the one of the lowest mortality rates on the region with just 0 0.7 uh, and we had a positive uh, a scenario for for the contention of the spread which is, was very successful for the first two months since it started on May 6th, on March, I'm sorry, 6th, when it started. And, and this could be due to two main factors. First, a national coverage of health system that has been created since 1941. And second, to an early adoption of restriction measures uh, recommended from the World Health, health Organization and other measures like coordinator Baker circulation restriction, commercial activities restrictions, beaches and borders closer, that it's uh, actually the borders are supposed to be open today, but I'm not sure what will happen. Um, but lately we have experienced uh, the increase of positive cases because one, people are lowering precautions, like they're like going out more often and everything. And second, because we have, um, difficult situation with our neighbor Nicaragua where the national scenario is not very clear about what's going on um, and because we have a very uh, and a great commercial and immigration exchange uh, that we always had so the cases have been increasing we also had a lot of seasoned workers uh, coming from from Nicaragua and we right now are just straining the quarantine and circulation measures on the parts of the country uh, that are being most affected uh, for this situation in particular. And actually, last week, the government uh, addressed the situation, creating a partnership with the United Nations to fortify the measures. And, and we are expecting more information about it and how they will address the situation. Um, that being said, uh, I would like to focus on speaking about uh, how we can address this new normal we are experiencing. Uh, in terms of education, uh, here in Costa Rica, schools started to gradually close around March 16th and in short, the, the Ministry of Education took actions to continue lessons. But it has been definitely a challenge, as we all know. Um, Costa Rica is a country that probably invests around 8% of its GDP in education. And the coverage is almost national, but taking effective actions to ensure learning um, during this emergency situation has been very difficult from what I can perceive. Um, here, the authorities had announced that for public ed education, um, they will continue for the second semester to bring virtual education. And for primary schools and for high schools, after the second week of July, students will be back gradually, staying positive that the scenario will continue uh, as it was um, projected. Uh, and here comes my first thought. Uh, COVID-19 had led us to innovate in almost every sphere of society. And from my perspective, education is one of the main aspects we need to hurry about innovation. For example, here in Costa Rica, around 80 to 90% of families have access to WhatsApp. But that doesn't mean the full coverage of connectivity or that all students have access to appliances, cell phones, laptops, or any other device. So how do we ensure systems of, and methods that accompany the student in remote learning? I have heard a lot of complaints of, system, uh, of the system we are implementing from too much homework load, to inefficient virtual classes, excessive hours in front of computers where the possibilities allow it because we know not everyone has uh, the chance to do it. And even children and just youths just not doing their homework because they feel burned out. Uh, on the other hand, and this is the second topic I would like to address, we're facing a major consequence of the pandemic that it's mental health being compromised. I have even experienced it myself, uh, despite that I'm very used to being working from home. Um, depression and anxiety are results of prolonged stages of social distancing. And, and there are a lot of expert recommendations that we should not extend lockdowns to unnecessary periods. Um, and this implies definitely open spaces despite of pandemic for young people to get distracted, go, out, go outside, connect with peers, and even with nature. This scenario becomes more complex uh, if we add to the equation that there is scientifically proof that in moments of crisis, young people are more likely to lose their jobs, which increases obviously uncertainty and worries about future. I know, I know a lot of people that 
uh, have lost their jobs or even have seen their, their working hours reduced, which directly impacts on our financial reality and autonomy. And also the way we live now is much more complex uh, than past generations, where, where the linear uh, path was a constant. Today, we decide to work, being an entrepreneur, being an activist, and much more activities all at the same time. Our generation is creating new ways of living, and this affects directly on the way we feel and the basic needs we have. So I would like to close my, my, interve my intervention from, with three basic ideas. The first one would be that we need to step up the effort for education in two ways. First, innovating on methodologies that ensure integral at distance and ensuring access to resources, including connectivity, appliances, and basic digital skills. I am aware that this is not an easy task to do, uh, but we need to be resilient and we need to start building partnerships and the partnerships needed to, to start spreading the access to most of youth population since we are not sure when this situation will end. Second, we need to start talking, and this webinar is a great way to do it, about how this new normal is affecting young people and how we can take action to ensure our welfare. For example, inviting young people to decision-making processes that are based on data. Collecting and analyzing data uh, about young people's realities is fundamental for taking action in response of COVID-19. Also, there are some actions like communication campaigns for mental health care that can be spread and scaled. And finally, we should rethink about the reality we're feeding. Young people like us, as I said, are living exponential lives uh, where the path is no longer the same for everyone. That requires completely new experiences, core skills and perspectives. And based on that, we need more spaces to create, learn and grow. So how are we ensuring the well-being of young people based on, use, on these new lifestyles and how this pandemic will redefine that? COVID-19, it's a complex situation, we all know that, and it implies multiple challenges for society. Maybe we cannot find all the answers yet, but it's imperative to start addressing all topics in order to, to find solutions, try, learn, innovate, and continue trying. Uh, and I would like to close uh, my intervention saying that uh, as Mo thought, I, I heard some, some days before that like long, 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 long term and short term, term start at the same time. So we have to start acting today for short term but also for long term actions thank you very much thank you very much Adriana. uh terrific and let's uh turn it now to joshua hi everyone uh this is joshua de Lauer. i hope you can hear me so first of all, thank you so much to Johns Hopkins and Dr. Bob and everyone to you know, get me on the panel and to represent the voices of young people and uh, to empower and to share the experiences I'm having with all of you. So first of all, I would like to start with the challenges uh, are being faced by the young people in our society, particularly in Pakistan. And uh, like young people are facing several challenges in regards to their mental health and their um, access to health facilities and services as access to health facilities. And uh, like uh, we have been uh, hearing a lot of examples and a lot of uh, stories from other young people and from our community that young people are not uh, getting productive activities and just because of the lockdown and COVID-19, uh, they're not being engaged in the productive activities, learning and exposure. So uh, staying at homes and uh, not doing productive activities, they are facing several issues. And uh, they are looking for some opportunities, but they don't have. And uh, like for past uh, three or four months, they are not doing anything. And uh, that is, you know, making them to uh, be a victim of anxiety and depression. So along with that, I would like to share, and I would like to appreciate that young leaders from different countries are not just sitting. They are just coming up and they're just, uh, you know, creating some opportunities for young people and they are just supporting the government and civil society organizations to combat the COVID-19 and uh, to, uh, you know, just not to forget the reproductive health. Because uh, now reproductive health and sexual health is not being prioritized by the governments, by the, um, like, 
country government and provincial governments and all the government officials because they are just you know focusing on uh, combating the COVID-19. So that's why we are sacrificing and we are going to face a lot of challenges in regards to SRA, SRH. So um, in Pakistan context, vulnerable communities are being more vulnerable. So I would like to share that governments and civil society and young leaders should not forget the vulnerable communities because they are already and they have been facing a, a lot of challenges. And uh, like uh, just because of vulnerable communities, we are facing and we are leaving a huge number of the young leaders and community. And it's our responsibility to work with the community and to work with the several people and several organizations. So, so I would like to share that uh, along with this, uh, I'm conducting uh, with my group and with Bipeer, like we started an initiative, Live Now, Live Now Together, just to create opportunities for young people and uh, to share success stories and to uh, share uh, success stories and motivational stories with them, you know, to uh, motivate them that they are not forgotten and they're not, uh, you know, uh, neglected ones in this uncertain situation. So we started this campaign uh, to engage them and to, you know, uh, to create a platform for them to give their stories and to uh, participate in video competition and painting competition and, you know, just think like uh, after what what is happening in this world with COVID-19 because it's so depressing, it's so, you know, full of uh, anxiety for young people, for adolescents, you know, to face the situation and, you know, just to hear negative, negative, negative stories. So we have been creating and we have been conducting positive uh, stories and uh, positive platform for young people to share their success stories and uh, to share their impressions and uh, their feelings through painting and video. Along with that, uh, like uh, in Pakistan, I've been seeing and I've been hearing a lot that just because of COVID-19, we have been facing, uh, like particularly the families, like, you know, the gender-based violence has been increased, including women, transgenders, and other vulnerable communities. So that's why I'm saying that vulnerable communities should be focused as well. And uh, along with that, uh, like what we have been doing during this uh, uncertain situation, along with a small group, and uh, we started an app, we made a mobile app to you know, provide the contraceptives because in Pakistan, contraceptives and access to contraceptives and just access to information is quite stigmatized and tabutized. So we should think and uh, we have to face a lot of challenges in our country's context that these things should not be discussed and these things uh, is not possible to discuss openly. So we do things and we, you know, we were uh, we still work to empower young people and to, you know, overcome and uh, uh, to strengthen their reproductive health and uh, practices. So we have been providing contraceptives and we, at their home doorsteps, they could use the mobile app and they could just anonymously uh, order the contraceptive and they could, they could get the contraceptive at their doorsteps. So we got quite impressive and positive response from the young people and from other users that uh, they they just ordered and requested the contraceptives and we provided them at their doorstep. So it was quite uh, good and it was quite, uh, you know, uh, uh, it was quite good for us that we are doing this because according to the UNICEF report that was recently launched that Pakistan uh, will be delivering like around 5 million babies till December 2020. So it's not an easy task and it's not a simple thing that uh, there will be more 5 million births in a few months in Pakistan. So we will be facing a lot of challenges in regards to delivery challenges, uh, unsafe abortion practices, and uh, MMR rate will be increased as well. So young people should join hands with the civil society, with the government, and I would say that government and civil society should create the opportunities to engage the young voices and young people on their platforms, on their initiatives, to use their ideas and to strengthen their ideas to work in the community. And again, I would like to appreciate all the young people who are not just sitting at their places, who are not just sitting at their homes, but they are just coming up with the new ideas and innovative ideas to support the other young people of their countries and globally to combat this uh, uncertain situation of COVID-19 and, uh, and to secure the sexual reproductive health and rights. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Joshua.
And uh, I'm pleased that Sadia Rahman, uh, who was having some technical difficulties uh, initially getting on, has joined us uh, from Bangladesh. Sadia is a youth activist, a trainer, an advocate for youth rights. Uh, she is one of the uh, 120 under 40 uh, leaders identified by the Gates Institute. Uh, she's the youth focal point for family planning 2020 uh, in her country. Uh, she has uh, worked with a group of young professionals to create a youth-led platform for policy and advocacy. Uh, and uh, her work allows for a uh, broad-based approach to family planning through a feminist uh, uh, lens. I had the opportunity uh, to meet her. She was uh, selected to be the opening youth speaker uh, at uh, the most recent international conference on uh, family planning in Kigali. Let me turn it to you, uh, Sadia. Thank you, Paul, for uh, this opportunity and welcome everyone. So this is Sadia Rahman from Bangladesh and I, I, I agree with all of the uh, panelists and in Bangladesh, this scenario is um, not better uh, than these countries. And uh, it's been around uh, three months of lockdown in Bangladesh right now. And uh, uh, things are, uh, it's, uh, Currently is the peak of coronavirus in Bangladesh and there are about 3,000 uh, getting affected every day. So all the education and institutes are closed uh, for three months already and few of the uh, urban-based uh, educational institutes have uh, started, um, they are conducting online classes. But uh, still the uh, public university students and uh, mostly ru ruler uh, uh, based educational institute couldn't actually go for online classes because it, it needs um, internet uh, connection, it will need devices and also um, and uh, electricity at time. But uh, it, it, it seems that this technical uh, procedure wasn't actually set up before this situation and when we are in the middle of a pandemic we actually cannot uh, have anything uh, weekly. So it's actually affecting um, uh, many uh, students and, and uh, there are uh, students who were about to graduate maybe uh, now they have to wait uh, for an uncertain time that uh, how, how this their graduation uh, should be done. And also for the uh, rural uh, area students, uh, they, they, their education is almost uncertain. And uh, connecting with these issues, the mental health is a big issue now because uh, the peer connection and uh, the uh, social distancing is really affecting the youth mostly and uh, most of the activities has been um, online based right now so uh, it's been three months and uh, people are getting quite anxious now and uh, uh, also the uh, the the perk of being a uh, quarantine being in quarantine is uh, getting um, lesser day by day i would say because uh there there uh, there's no strong online um online um safety net i would say that uh, youths are more vulnerable in online platforms right now and and uh i think it the situation is getting um or and day by day due to some incidents and uh, the cybersecurity system is not actually working. So uh, also one of the, apart from these issues, one of the major issues that's, uh, that's uh, happening in Bangladesh, that's gender-based violence, it has increased, um, increased uh, majorly, I would say in last uh, three to four months in Bangladesh. And isolation is often um, 
is a uh, golden opportunity for uh, 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 perpetrators as, as, as a tool, tool. And this lockdown is an, is an opportunity for them. And uh, there has been incidents like uh, a husband came on, murdered his uh, wife while streaming the whole um, whole thing on uh, Facebook Live, and then he surrendered at a nearest police station. And also, there there's been incidents uh, that uh, a mother went to uh, receive the uh, receive the father's dead body at hospitals due to coronavirus, and the girl was alone at home, and she was brutally raped and murdered uh, afterwards. So. Um, I think um, being stuck at home is really challenging for all of us, but it's it's more uh, it's a nightmare for the uh, domestic um, uh, domestic violence victims, and and I think a crucial net of safety is is really required right now for those vulnerable women and girls, um, and 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 mostly. Uh, I am say Bangladesh have uh, uh, Rohingya refugees in camps, so uh, they are also in a vulnerable uh, situation right now due to COVID-19 because uh, the um, the emergency support is really limited right now. Um, uh, it's not stopped totally, but support is limited, so they are also uh, also in, in a vulnerable state already. Uh, they were in a vulnerable position, but the vulnerability has increased in this coronavirus situation. And uh, also the health, uh, health, uh, mostly the sexual and reproductive health uh, issue in uh, Bangladesh has also uh, been a challenge in this coronavirus situation because the due to lockdown, uh, people actually cannot access to health services. So, health service centers and also uh, there's been a uh, scarcity of health providers in those health centers as well so um, I, and and the the other thing is this is already monsoon in bangladesh so during monsoon there are areas which is vulnerable uh, prone to uh, flood and uh, during floods and with coronavirus and 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 being locked with uh, maybe a domestic um, uh, as a victim of domestic violence is is quite a nightmare for uh, I I wouldn't say only for girls and women but also in some cases for for adults and boys as, as well. So uh, so I think uh, this is this is a high time that uh, everyone in the um, among the stakeholders, government, uh, um, also uh, work, social workers, and we as the youth have some responsibility to act right now. And uh, and I think uh, uh, we should act to uh, immediate act to this immediate effect impact of coronavirus. Also, build a system that will actually. Uh, um, offer some of the uh, most uh, uh, most risk and women and girls who are in, at risk for the uh, longest um, impact of coronavirus as well. So I think that's for right now from me, and I will answer if there is any other questions from the audience. Thank you so much, Sadia. Uh, what we're going to do now is turn it to Eka to facilitate uh, an internal conversation for uh, a few minutes, and then we're going to uh, turn to uh, the uh, uh, questions. So Eka, let me turn it to you and see how uh, people would like to reflect on what each other said. Yes, thank you, Bob. So, so actually, we, ha we have already traveled to uh, several countries. We've already exposed with some conditions that we, we all can imagine happens in several countries in terms of the COVID-19 situations. And uh, I think that uh, all of us uh, face as similar conditions in each country, even though we have kind of like a different kind of uh, numbers, cases, and also 
uh, a particular conditions. So guys from the panels, maybe you can uh, give a questions or a response to another uh, panels as well. If you have some kind of questions, you can uh, directly maybe raise your hands or maybe directly speak to another panelist as well to to give any question yeah so uh, maybe adriana joshua sadia yitnik what do you think about the other uh, countries conditions in terms of COVID-19 because because actually we uh, almost all of us kind of share uh, particular similar conditions that we face especially for young people as well maybe you want to dig yeah have more understanding in other kind of conditions from several countries maybe yeah Adriana yeah thank you Eka yeah as as you said we all are, are living like it, it's like uh COVID, it's impacting us all as humanity but uh in different uh situation and what one aspect more in one hundred and less in another and and so on but uh i would like to to reflect on uh, how we as young people foresee the future uh, after COVID-19. Uh, we know uh, that this is a situation that probably will not uh, be ending soon, maybe not this year, we don't know if next year. Um, but uh, and, and, and as we said, like this is a situation that, that can be very like heartbreaking for for a lot of people, uh, but at the same time, uh, there are still space for innovation, for trying new things, and and for without like being blind of what's really happening because this is a reality. Uh, but uh, how we can foresee uh, like future after this? Uh, what are the actions uh, you think like um, will be leading? after this because uh as i said uh this is something that is starting now we have to start taking actions uh of long term uh, now because it's starting now and uh, what we do now will 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 of course um impact future and and we as young leaders um we, we need to start thinking about that and and, and i think that that's the part and, and, and the, the importance of being resilient, right? Uh, taking, trying to, to, to look forward on what we can do. So, so I would like to, to ask that to you. Okay, so, so you're asking to me or <laughs> the other to, to you all, to you all. Oh, to you all. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you for your questions, Adriana. So, yeah, I think it's kind of like a very um, important discussions that we have to discuss as young, as young people. Actually, it's not only us we, uh, from the panelists, also young people there uh, from the attendees as well uh, as young people. Um, so maybe who will... Uh, answer the questions first, maybe. I can give times for my other panelists, lovely okay. panelists. Maybe Joshua, Joshua or Sadia. Yeah. Uh, Joshua or Sadia? Uh, maybe Yitnek are trying to uh, connect to us. Yeah, Joshua. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I guess like uh, in this uncertain situation, I'm fine. Uh, uh, like, I'm glad that a lot of organizations and youth led initiatives are you know shifting from the public events and uh, all you know community events to digital events and digital platform. So I guess like uh, yes, we cannot stop spreading awareness and we cannot stop spreading uh, uh, quality information in regards to SRH. So I guess uh, creating digital opportunities is very important in the current uncertain situation. And uh, we have to come up with the new ideas, like what we can do and how we can engage young people uh, beyond COVID-19 to uh, practice and to you know, be well aware of the SRH rights. 
So I guess, yes, uh, creating digital spaces and digital opportunities for uh, young people to be engaged and uh, to ensure their good mental health and well-being is very important in this uncertain situation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I guess along with this, artistic medium are quite important in this uh, situation because uh, our community is facing uh, several mental health challenges, uh, particularly during this lockdown situation and COVID-19. So artistic mediums are quite important in this situation, you know, to engage them in uh, music and art activities to ensure their good mental health and well-being. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, uh, so uh, thank you very much, Joshua, for, uh, for your answers. So the other part is maybe Adriana. Yeah, uh, no, Adriana gives the question. Sadia, Sadia. <laughs> yeah. What do you think? So yeah. uh, I think I, I totally agree with Joshua that this uh, online activities is really important for engaging uh, people and also embrace, embracing this new normal. But we also have to think about the, um, the uh, what, what is it, the uh, effect, uh, yeah, maybe. So how, um, sorry, I just can't find the right word for this. So how uh, effective the, um, online program is. I think that's also important to think about. Like there are already, uh, uh, there are already, I, I think uh, it's 95% people uh, in Bangladesh have access to mobile phone. And I don't, I don't know the percentage of people have access to internet. But if we can use this opportunity as uh, sending um, maybe help through uh, online, that's great. But how we're going to implement this, like for example, uh, in the case of domestic violence, how we are going to ensure the, that the online um, call center maybe are working to support enough to uh, 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 lock down women who are prone to domestic violence. So I think along with these, uh, these online activities, we have to think something that that would uh, work also in the ground. Uh, obviously, uh, obviously, uh, keeping uh, the uh, safety from coronavirus in mind. But I think it's high time that uh, we think about the groundwork as well at, to, to adopt this new normal. And, and this could be through, um, through our EGOT volunteers, through our government, through our uh, uh, partners and donors. Uh, so uh, I think uh, also um, we already have a uh, established system for, for support uh, for the, of these issues, but it's high time that we combine the online media the social medias and the groundworks together. So we can bind something together to have a impactful action. So, yeah. Yeah, so thank you, Sadia. I think you raised, uh, I think you raised the important point as well to combine the online kind of uh, systems and then uh, ground system because we know that not all of the people have internet access and then uh, in this in this kind of crisis all of uh, the information and, ed and education centers to uh, from the social media and from the online um, online systems mm. and then um, because of Yitnik um, maybe he has unstable connection so i would like to uh, share the questions that raised by adriana Yutnik. so what do you think about uh or what what young people have to do for the future or maybe initiate or innovate to do innovations uh for for the future what do you think Yutnik? okay thank you very much and i'm really sorry that i had two uh electricity blackout, so that's why like my internet was not stable. So um, it's such a, an excellent question, especially like most of our attendees participants are the youth. So what can they do? What can we do like in regarding small scale, large scale and different platforms? So the number one thing is that of like 
we should not underestimate ourselves, that we should not say that since we are young, young or youth, since we are adolescents, we cannot contribute these things. These are meant to be for those like older people. These are meant to be like for those policymakers or such things like that. We have to value ourselves and try to seek like uh, different capacity building trainings. It can be online and it can be like interpreting the data and the things that we have with that we can see in our society. Um, so the thing is that of starting from online campaign. So for instance, as, as I mentioned it earlier, the gender based violence, the, the uh, rape and other different doleful things has been increasing in Ethiopia. So there are multiple youths and adolescents starting a social media campaign that I'm not gonna sit down and keep quiet regarding this gender-based violence and things like that, that to the level in which our uh, president, uh, Her Excellency uh, Sahalor Zodi have also given a very good emphasis on this one, that uh, increasing the criminal uh, law and justice and also protecting these uh, children as well as women from gender-based violence and from those perpetrators. So I have seen like how much like we can advocate on social media for the things that we have just believed in. And the other thing is that of, as a young people, we are vibrant and we are keen to observe different difficulties in our society. So, uh, so it's, it's better for us to be compassionate as well as understanding for our community. And not only just like to mention those of the problems, but also try to become like innovative and try to come up with the solution. And on the other hand, like there should be a supportive system from the government, from international organizations that should support the young people so that they could amplify their, their voice and come up with the uh, innovative solutions. So this is uh, my input. Yeah, so yeah, thank you, Yetnek. Uh, so how about you, it, um, Adriana? Yeah. Yeah, thank you. I would like to, to add something that it's really important to highlight uh, about what you all said uh, about we are like we as millennial all, all the generations that come after us are our generations that were raised with uh, all technology all digital and virtualization um, spaces uh, and that's great because I, I think COVID-19 uh, show us that we could make a lot of things digital that before we think we did we couldn't and and, and it's great but uh in terms of ensuring welfare i think it's important to us to understand that even in digitalization and in virtualization as as sadia said we need to take actions to to make this like um also like ways to to also to connect not only virtual but how we ensure that this humane phase of virtuality because um of course we as human uh we need different uh types of of interacting and and ensuring this like um close like bonds even in virtualization and in the digitalization it's very important for us uh, in, in order to, to keep like mental health and to keep everyone safe. Uh, and, and I think it, it's important also to like, and a real action we could take as young people, it's always been like checking on our peers, like, hey, how are you doing? How are you feeling? Are you okay if we can do it? Because uh, like, having this like connection with everyone even in lockdown it's really important for us to keep on like like heading up with with this pandemic and even if we are in situations of <clears throat> i don't know violence or any other situation it will be more easy for us to talk if we feel like we are being accompanied with someone else or or, or that someone else is looking for our if we are okay and 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 yeah making i want to 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 say all this because we need to make sure that digitalization and virtualization comes along with staying and keeping this humane phase of of connection and and 
taking care for the other and being empathic uh, because as we said, not everyone is dealing with the pandemic in the same way. So we have to be empathic and, and keep on checking everyone in, church, in, in order to, to just be there and create networks of, uh, of support. I think that uh, your message, Adriana, is a very powerful one. And I think uh, a good place to uh, wrap up this uh, conversation that I think has been absolutely extraordinary. I want to thank you, Sadia, uh, Joshua, uh, Yidnik, uh, for really a terrific conversation, and Eka for your comments and facilitation as well. There are clearly questions we did not get to. We will be sending them out to the panelists and asking uh, uh, you, the panelists, to uh, send uh, responses that we can circulate to everyone. For now, thank you. Stay safe, stay well, continue the passionate, committed work and engaging young people in transforming, not just staying safe during COVID, but taking the lessons that we learned from this pandemic into the future and doing our work and life differently. For now, thank you all. Thank you very much, Robert, for this space. I think it's really important. Thank you. Thank you very yeah, much. Thank all. you so much, Bob, and thank you so much, everyone, thank for you, joining us. Yeah, thank you so much, Bob, and thank you for everyone who joined this kind of conversation.